Hello dear students, welcome to this program. Today we are discussing an interesting topic which is programmed cell death, stem cells and therapeutic cloning. Before discussing them in detail, let us first know its objectives. The main objectives are to understand programmed cell death, which is also known as apoptosis, to understand about different pathways involved, to know about stem cells and embryonic stem cells, and to know about therapeutic cloning. Now, let us start with programmed cell death. Many cells can precisely control the time of their own death by the process of programmed cell death or apoptosis which is derived from the Greek word which means drooping off as in leaves drooping in the fall. The term apoptosis was coined in 1972 by John Kerr, Andrew Willey and A. R. Curie. Apoptosis or programmed cell death is a normal occurrence in which an orchestrated sequence of events lead to death of a cell. Death by apoptosis is a neat orderly process characterized by the overall shrinkage in volume of the cell and its nucleus, the loss of adhesion to neighboring cells, the formation of bulbs at the cell surface, the dissection of the chromatin into small fragments and the rapid engulfment of the corpse by phagocytosis. Why do our bodies have unwanted cells and where do we find cells that become targeted for elimination? The short answer is almost anywhere you look. It has been estimated that thousands of cells in the human body die every day by apoptosis. For example, Apoptosis is involved in the elimination of cells that have sustained irreparable genomic damage. Recent studies have focused on the events that lead to the activation of a cell's suicide program. Caspases are a distinctive group of cysteine proteases, that is, proteases with a key cysteine residue in the catalytic site that are activated at an early stage of apoptosis and are responsible for triggering most if not all of the changes observed during cell death. Apoptosis can be triggered by both internal stimuli such as abnormalities in the DNA and external stimuli such as certain cytokines that is proteins secreted by cells of the immune system. Studies indicate that external stimuli activate apoptosis by a signaling pathway called the extrinsic pathway that is distinct from that utilized by internal stimuli which is called the intrinsic pathway. Here we will discuss the extrinsic and intrinsic pathways separately. However, it should be noted that there is crosstalk between these pathways and that extracellular apoptotic signals can cause activation of the intrinsic pathway. Now coming to extrinsic pathway of apoptosis. In extrinsic pathway, the stimulus for apoptosis is carried out by an extracellular messenger protein called tumor necrosis factor, TNF, which was named for its ability to kill tumor cells. The extracellular signal molecules bind with cell surface receptors, which are termed as death receptors. One typical example is FAS receptor or simply FAS, that is a member of TNF receptor family. Binding of TNF to the trimeric receptor produces a change in conformation of the receptor's death domain which leads to the recruitment of the number of proteins. The last proteins to join the complex that assemble at the inner surface of the plasma membrane are two procaspase 8 molecules. These proteins are called procaspases because each is a precursor of a caspase. It contains an extra portion 
that must be removed by proteolytic processing to activate the enzyme. The final mature enzyme that is caspase 8 contains 4 polypeptide chains derived from 2 uh, procaspase precursors. In all of the signaling pathways, the binding of an extracellular ligand causes a change in conformation of a receptor that leads to the binding and activation of proteins situated downstream the pathway. Caspase 8 is described as an initiator caspase because it initiates apoptosis by cleaving and activating downstream or executioner caspases that carry out the control self-destruction of the cell. Now coming to intrinsic pathway of apoptosis. Internal stimuli such as irreparable genetic damage, lack of oxygen that is hypoxia, extremely high concentrations of cytosolic calcium, viral infection or severe oxidative stress trigger apoptosis by the intrinsic pathway. Activation of the intrinsic pathway is regulated by members of the BCL2 family of proteins which are characterized by the presence of one or more BH domains. It is thought that BEX or BAC proteins undergo a change in conformation that causes them to insert into the outer mitochondrial membrane and assemble into a multi-subunit protein line channel. Once formed, this channel dramatically increases the permeability of the outer mitochondrial membrane and promotes the release of certain mitochondrial proteins, most notably cytochrome C, which resides in the intermembrane space. Mitochondrial membrane permeabilization may be accelerated by a rise in cytosolic calcium levels following release of the ion through the endoplasmic reticulum. Nearly all of the cytochrome molecules present in all of a cell's mitochondria can be released from an apoptotic cell in a period as short as 5 minutes. Release of pro-apoptotic mitochondrial proteins such as cytochrome C is apparently the point of no return, that is, an event that irreversibly commits the cell to apoptosis. Once in the cytosol, cytochrome C forms part of a multiprotein complex called the apoptosome that also includes several molecules of procaspase 9. Procaspase 9 molecules are thought to become activated by simply joining the multiprotein complex and do not require proteolytic cleavage. Extrinsic that is receptor mediated and intrinsic that is mitochondrial mediated pathways ultimately converge by activating the same executioner gas bases which cleave the same cellular targets. As cells execute the apoptotic program, they lose contact with the neighbors and start to shrink. Finally, the cell disintegrates into a condensed membrane enclosed apoptotic body. The entire apoptotic program can be executed in less than an hour. Now moving on another topic that is stem cells and maintenance of adult tissues. Stem cells are defined as undifferentiated cells that are capable of self-renewal that is production of more cells like themselves and they are multipotent that is they are capable of differentiating into two or more mature cell types. Hematopoietic stem cells that is HSCs of the bone marrow are only one type of stem cell. Most if not all of the organs in a human adult contain stem cells that are capable of replacing the particular cells of the tissue in which they are found. Even the adult brain, which is not known for its ability to regenerate, contains stem cells that can generate new neurons and glial cells, the supportive cells of the brain. There is considerable optimism that similar types of therapeutic approaches could be used for humans. The human heart, for example, 
contains cardiac stem cells that are capable of differentiating into the cells that form both the muscle tissue of the heart that is the cardiomyocytes of the myocardium and the heart's blood vessels. These stem cells might have the potential to regenerate healthy heart tissue in a patient who has experienced a serious heart attack or is suffering from congestive heart failure. Adult stem cells are an ideal system for cell replacement therapies because they can be isolated directly from the patient, grown in culture and reintroduced back into the same patient. Although adult stem cells may ultimately prove to be in to prove an invaluable resource in cell replacement therapy, clinical studies carried out to date have been disappointing. Much of the excitement that has been generated in the field over the past decade has come from studies on embryonic stem cells, which are a type of stem cells isolated from very young mammalian embryos. Now we will discuss embryonic stem cell. These are the cells in the early embryo that give rise to all of the various structures of the mammalian fetus. Unlike adult stem cells, embryonic stem cells are pluripotent, that is, they are capable of differentiating into every type of cell in the body. In most cases, human embryonic stem cells have been isolated from embryos provided by in vitro fertilization clinics. Worldwide, dozens of genetically distinct human embryonic stem cell lines, each derived from a single embryo, are available for experimental investigation. The long-range goal of clinical researchers is to learn how to cox embryonic stem cells to differentiate in culture into each of the many cell types that might be used for cell replacement therapy. Considerable progress has been made in this pursuit and numerous studies have shown that tra transplants of differentiated embryonic stem cell derived cells can improve the conditions of animals with diseased or damaged organs. The first trials in humans are likely to utilize cells called oligodendrocytes that produce the myelin sheaths that become wrapped around nerve cells. It was found by trial and error that pure colonies of oligodendrocytes would differentiate from human embryonic stem cells that were cultured in a medium containing insulin, thyroid hormone and a combination of certain growth factors. When implants of these human oligodendrocytes were transplanted into rats with paralyzing spinal cord injuries, the animals regained considerable mortality. Clinical trials are also planned for the treatment of type 1 diabetes and the eye disease macular degeneration. The primary risk with this type of procedure is the unnoticed presence of undifferentiated embryonic stem cells among the differentiated cell population. Undifferentiated embryonic stem cells are capable of forming a type of bending tumor called a teratoma which may contain a biosphere mass of various differentiated tissues, including hair and teeth. The formation of a teratoma within the central nervous system could have severe consequences. In addition, the culture of embryonic stem cells at the present time involves the use of non-human biological materials, which also poses potential risk of causing disease. Although adult stem cells lack the undifferent, unlimited differentiation capacity that is characteristic of embryonic stem cells, they do have advantage over embryonic stem cells in that they can be isolated from the individuals who are being treated and thus will not face immunologic rejection when used in subsequent cell replacement. Now let's talk about therapeutic cloning. It may be possible to customize embryonic stem cells so that they possess the same genetic makeup of the individual who is being treated and thus would not be subject to attack by the recipient's immune system. This can be likely accomplished by a roundabout procedure called 
Somatic Cell Nuclear Transfer, SCNT, which is also known as therapeutic cloning, that begins with an unfertilized egg, a cell that is obtained from the ovaries of an unrelated woman donor. In this approach, the nucleus of the unfertilized egg would be replaced by the nucleus of a cell from the patient to be treated, which would cause the egg to have the same chromosome composition as that of the patient. The egg would then be allowed to develop to an early embryonic stage and the embryonic stem cells would be removed, cultured and induced to differentiate into the type of cells needed by the patient. Because this procedure involves the formation of a human embryo that is used only as a source of embryonic stem cells, there are major ethical questions that must be settled before it could be routinely practiced. In addition, the process of somatic cell nuclear transfer is so expensive and technically demanding that it's highly improbable that it could ever be practiced as part of any routine medical treatment. It's more likely that if embryonic stem cell based therapy is ever practiced, it would depend on the use of a bank of hundreds or thousands of different embryonic stem cells. Such a bank could contain cells that are close enough as a tissue match to be suitable for use in the majority of patients. It's all about this topic. Hope you understood. Thank you.